Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to the Carter Center. I hope you're all well this evening. Those of you lucky enough to be here this evening because this is a sold out uh, house tonight, but I I'm told that uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Paul Ryan is visiting Atlanta and they've closed down the expressways, so we're likely to have some stragglers coming in. Uh, the, 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 this is a nonpartisan center, the Carter Center. As you know, we just happen to have a former Democrat as president as our founder and leader. But uh, the Republican Party is very well organized. I saw a uh, BBC survey that said that uh, Obama is three times as popular in China as Romney. And I think what they probably realized is we'd have this talk on China, so hence send Ryan down to... Make sure we didn't go too far down this pathway. It's a very timely topic this evening that brings us together. I'm asked to make a few um, introductory remarks about our procedures and to remind you that these conversations at the Carter Center are a regular event. It's a series that allows us to showcase both our peace program as tonight and health programs on alternative conversations. And you can check on the upcoming conversations at our website, cartercenter.org slash conversations. We're particularly pleased this evening to have students among us, the next generation. We were saying over at dinner that uh, when I was a kid, uh, I wanted to study China, but never thought I'd get access to the country. And uh, uh, no bigger question is posed to the global system than uh, the China, uh, more students arriving. Uh, than the future of China in a globalized world, so we're delighted to have students here for this conversation tonight. I also had to start promptly at 7 in order to let our online audience know that uh, we are in fact here and getting to work. Um, they will be following us live cast and they will be sending in uh, uh, Twitter questions. Anyone who's picking this up now and wants to avail themselves of that opportunity. The hashtag is Convos, C-O-N-V-O-S, T-C-C, for the Carter Center. So our topic uh, this evening is what's next in China, and we are really very, very privileged to have uh, such distinguished guests join us for the conversation tonight. Uh, two professors, uh, uh, Professor Joseph uh, Few Smith from the Department of International Relations and Political Science at Boston University, gentleman in the center, who's also served as director of the East Asia Interdisciplinary Studies Program. He's, uh, his expertise are in comparative politics, Chinese domestic and international politics. He's a frequent visitor to China. Uh, you are been given brochures which have more details about his biography, but also uh, the several books that he's published. There's enough details in those brochures to order the books. Uh, after this talk, I'm sure you'll want to rush out and do that uh, uh, from, from Amazon.com or wherever. Uh, it's always a good idea. Uh, the second guest, uh, Professor William Alford, is renowned as a legal scholar and an expert on Chinese law. He is the Henry L. Stimson Professor of Law at Harvard and Vice Dean for the graduate program and international studies program and director of the East Asia Legal Studies program at Harvard. Further details of his uh, varied and accomplished career are also in the brochure. Now, if I may, just for a second, diverge uh, because Professor Alfred was well known to the Carter Center before this question of China came up. He is a devoted friend of a colleague and friend of ours but it's an uh, interesting and uh, inspiring history. Uh, Professor Alford was uh, a college uh, classmate with uh, Professor Abdullahi Anayim of uh, Emory University. And Abdullahi is sitting in the front row down here. And uh, Abdullahi, do you want to just sort of stand up and wave to the, too, too embarrassed? We celebrate his presence among us. He's a great friend of the Carter Center, but he came here from a rather difficult route. Uh, Professor Alford knew that he had been thrown in political detention in Sudan some 25 years ago, was sufficiently alarmed and concerned by what was happening at, in, in, in Sudan at that time under uh, President El uh, um, 
Numeri back then, and, and uh, asked President Carter if he wouldn't mind writing a letter on uh, Abdullahi's behalf. And uh, President Carter immediately did so, and uh, that helped to get him released from detention over to Atlanta, and of course the rest is history. For the last 13 years he's been on the faculty and a great colleague, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, this evening's event was organized and motivated by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Yahweh Lu. He's the head of the China program, and he's uh, at the far right, on my far right on the stage. Uh, Dr. Liu was studying uh, American history and, and political and diplomatic history at Hawaii in, in 1989 when Tiananmen occurred and, and I think decided that moment it was uh, a good idea to continue his education in the United States and to get it, dedicate himself to improving U.S.-China relations. So he came to Emory and did his Ph.D. here on diploma American diplomatic history. Uh, getting it in 1996, and since 1997, he's been involved in various ways with the Carter Center directing uh, our China program, and that's also in the brochure. Uh, in 2008, uh, Yahweh uh, wrote a book that got a great following in China called Obama, The Man Who Will Change America, and we're all looking forward to the se sequel. It's likely to come out in 2012, Yahweh. <laughs> Uh, it's hard not to get. Um, uh, it's hard to ignore what's what what's going on in China. Uh, the New York Times today: Better ways to deal with China. The cover story of foreign affairs. Um, the presidential debates. We heard. If you're, we're not inundated with political advertisements because we're not a state in the swing state category. But for those of you who've been seeing this thing by uh, de defeatdebt.com, which is shows Chinese talking with subtitles about the deterioration of America and says that we'll all someday soon be working for the Chinese. Uh, and it's uh, an appeal to, to break down big government here in the US. It's all around us. But the question that was posed by um, uh, Ari Nair's new book, just out on the history of human rights, is perhaps the best jumping off point for our conversation tonight. In this history of international human rights, toward the end of this new book, uh, Ari Nair uh, makes the uh, obvious observation that um, the great unanswered question in global human rights today is whether Chinese citizens will eventually force their own regime, their own regime, to acknowledge that economic freedom can never be secure without political and civil rights. And that really cuts to the questions we ask here at the Carter Center in our China program. And I thought we might be able to start this conversation tonight moving down the line to sort of what is happening in the domestic political and legal uh, 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 environment in China. And the second half of our conversation, which will run for about 40 minutes, will be on the likelihood of political reform looking forward and the future of US-China relations looking forward. I should give you a brief warning that when this meeting was conceived, uh, Dr. Liu was absolutely convinced that the Chinese 18th Party Congress would have been completed and so we would be commenting on the situation. But funny thing, politics intervened. And politics intervened to delay the party congress until two days after our own presidential election here. So it will begin on November 8. So it's in that context that I'm now going to take my chair and, and, and invite uh, Professor Fusmith to please uh, uh, give a few thoughts on the contemporary situation in Chinese politics. Well, thank you very much, John, for, uh, for that great introduction. And you're perfectly right. When I accepted the invitation to come down here, I was going to spew wisdom because I would know the outcome of the party <laughs> congress. And now, whatever I say, you can look at it three weeks from now and say Few Smith was wrong. Um, but I think that since we don't know the outcome of the party congress yet, uh, I think that the, my purpose uh, here is to try to put the per Party Congress into a particular context. And in that regard, I'd like to put it in the context of really two trends that I see. Uh, one at sort of, if you will, the societal level, and the other at the elite level. And I will come back and suggest that the figure of Bo Xilai, who you've been reading about in the press, the former party secretary of Chongqing, who has been now uh, expelled from the party and will be up on a variety of charges soon, um, 
kind of links these two elements of the system together. And so I hope I can put the Congress as well as that event in a little bit of context. Uh, on the societal level, um, what we've seen over the last several years is actually a rise of uh, mass incidents. Uh, if you look at the official figures in 1993, there were 8,700. In 2005, there were 87,000. And for some reason, the government stopped publishing those figures after that. Uh, but the, uh, a, a widely used figure, and I don't know if it's accurate, for 2010 was 180,000. Uh, that would, I know China's a big place with lots of people, but that's about 500 a day. Uh, so there's a lot of social tension in various parts of China. Uh, by the way, I won't defend those numbers. Uh, I don't know if they're accurate, but I think that everybody would agree that there are more mass incidents, they're larger, and they're more violent than they have been in the past. In other words, there's a very serious governance problem in large parts of China. Uh, and that's something that we all hoped, uh, as people observing China and hoping for a, um, uh, an evolution of the political situation there, that incremental reform, including a variety of ref political reform experiments that have taken place throughout China from the mid-1990s until well, they, they do continue today, but I would say at a, at a lesser pace. We, we're hoping that those um, experiments and those, that form of incremental reform would bring about a better um, sense of governance in China and provide what you might call a political soft landing for the country. A lot of our Chinese friends always assured us that uh, you know, China would incrementally turn around right? It would, uh, step by step, it would come around to a, uh, a more democratic, in some sense of the word, uh, a place. And unfortunately, that really has not happened, or at least it has not happened yet. And so you have a lot of serious societal problems. Uh, at the elite level, I think we're also at a critical turning point. Uh, as you know, Deng Xiaoping died uh, 23 years ago. I think that's right. Uh, uh, 1997. That's not quite right. Um, 25 years ago. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, before he died, made sure that Jiang Zemin would serve uh, for two terms as general secretary, and that Hu Jintao, the current general secretary, for at least three more weeks, uh, would serve 10 years after that. So what Ch Deng Xiaoping did, and I, I have great respect for Deng Xiaoping as uh, China's leader. He did a tremendous amount of good for China. He also provided political peace at the top level for China for 20 years after his own passing. Pretty good for a guy that's not even alive. Uh, the trouble is that now the shadow of the great man is indeed receding, and you have more contention among China's elite as to who should get the top political jobs. Uh, one reason, presumably, that the Congress has been delayed for a month uh, until November. Uh, in, the point is that as you move farther away from the revolution and you have a whole new generation of people coming up, it becomes harder and harder to evaluate who's made the contributions, who should go to the top positions. How do you compare? Zhang Guoli's, uh, uh, Guoli's uh, contributions in Tianjin, Yu Zhengsheng's in uh, Shanghai, Wang Yang's in Guangdong, and even Bo Xilai's in Chongqing. How do you compare this? And I think what we had all hoped for is that in these 20 years, there would be some institutional mechanisms, uh, perhaps at least voting within the Central Committee. They do straw poll voting, but it's not really a form and form, formal mechanism or anything determinative we would hope that somehow that would, um, would solve these problems. Instead, the problem seems to be alive and well. And what Bo Xilai was doing out in Chongqing was appealing both to these societal issues and to the elite politics. That is to say, he developed a, um, a very populist agenda. Mm, think Huey Long, 
something in that nature, right? A very populist, a neo-Maoist populist agenda. You strike down or strike at these uh, mafia-type uh, gangs in the city. Anybody opposed to law and order? I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, law and order is popular in China as it is in the United States. Very popular program. Uh, it seems that he committed several abuses in that campaign. But that's, uh, well, it's not actually a separate issue, but from a public relations point of view, it wasn't. Um, the singing of the revolutionary songs, I'll get Yahweh to demonstrate later on. Uh, <laughs> Marjorie, actually. Uh, in any case, uh, I will not demonstrate that, I, I guarantee you. No. Uh, even under torture, I do not sing. <laughs> well, uh, and, and maybe we should shift to law, because it doesn't know what the rule of law is in this, in this mess. In, in, well, and just, just at any case, the, the point was, he's reviving socialism, the spirit of, the, of socialism. Again, very popular, at least in certain sectors of society, but something that cuts against a lot of the reform agenda that we've seen including, I might say, law. So, uh, and, and what he was doing that was so unique in terms of elite politics was he was campaigning for office. You're used to p political campaigns. <laughs> China is not. And to sort of step out of sort of elite culture where you maybe bargain inside the system to building these bases of support um, was something really unusual. So it brings this elite politics and the societal problems together. Bo Xilai is no longer on the political stage uh, for a lot of reasons, including the death of a British man by the name of Neil Haywood. Uh, at any case, the issues are still out there. The societal issues are out there. The elite politics issues are out there. And I think we're going to see those again in another five years, and especially in another 10 years, when Xi Jinping is uh, leaving, leaving that office. Um, <clears throat> perhaps the interesting question for tonight that we can pursue later on is, can Xi Jinping, the heir apparent, really do anything about either or both of these problems or the way that the two connect with each other? And as I suggested above, he faces a tremendous challenge because at the societal level, you really have not built the institutions that const can constrain the abuse of power at the local level. And obviously, at the elite level, to engage in political reform of even fairly modest sorts, you very quickly encounter very powerful special interests that will stand up and say, we'd like to keep the system the way it is. And so I think Xi Jinping will be taking office at a very, very difficult time in Chinese politics. And uh, I think I can wish him luck. Yeah, let, 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 I mean, uh, sure. Bill, I mean, the, 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 is there a rule of law? We're, we're a nation of laws and a nation of lawyers. What's happening in China with regard to the rule of law? Well, thank you, John. And let me just say how delighted I am to be here at the Carter Center, given the, uh, both the record of the Carter Center and uh, President Carter being such an exemplary figure, both in office and after his term. So China's uh, embarked over the last 20 years in what is probably the world's most substantial effort at building a legal system, mm -hmm. right? 30 years ago, China had 2,000 lawyers. Today, it has 100 times as many. It had 12 law schools. Now it has 600. Now, some people might not see that as progress, but uh, the Chinese uh, government. How many do we have in the US? We have about 220. They have three times. They have about three times as many institutions that grant degrees Whoa. in law. Now, but as President Carter said, law and justice, justice is about more than law and lawyers. Justice mm -hmm. is, is about uh, uh, seeking truth and protecting uh, mm -hmm. vulnerable people. And the Chinese system, although uh, in the intention of the party and the state was to build a legal order, uh, it has uh, very many substantial problems of the type that my friend Joe Fusmith alluded to. Uh, there's extensive corruption, uh, local protectionism, uh, people who venture out to criticize the authorities too strenuously are not protected by law, but often punished uh, uh, by it. For me, what's most interesting is not so much the uh, challenges and problems that the uh, elite in Joe's division uh, uh, encounter, uh, the Bo Xi lies, or even uh, other celebrated figures. It's more the routine daily 
experience of law for ordinary Chinese citizens, and it's uneven. Uh, certainly better than it was 30 years ago, and yet still riven with a lot of problems. Just very quickly to give you a few illustrations, Chinese economists, not foreigners, but Chinese in China have estimated that uh, Chinese peasants have lost approximately $500 billion worth of value of land improperly expropriated. The Chinese government issued a white paper a couple of years ago about corruption that suggested 113,000 cadres in the year 2010 alone uh, had engaged in corrupt behavior. Another Chinese scholar has estimated that 99% of petitions that Chinese citizens file to sort of supplement to the legal system are denied. So, so there are some problems, some very serious problems and challenges. To be sure, there are some uh, more positive uh, signs afoot. Uh, citizens are, as Joe suggested, beginning to understand that they are um, told by the state that they have rights and people are beginning to uh, act on them. There is a very brave and vigilant uh, group of what are called Wei Chen or rights-oriented lawyers. And even uh, young judges are beginning uh, with better training to uh, uh, strive more and more to find creative ways to apply the law, to see their role as more uh, than that of being a, a party appendage. Uh, but ultimately, there are these very hard and profound challenges of the type Joe mentioned. It seems to me that if the law is to accomplish what, at one level at least, uh, the state hopes it will, there is a need for much more independence in the judiciary, much more autonomy for the legal system. Judges still are largely selected in important part because of their party background and loyalty. Uh, one would hope in the future that would be a less prominent feature. The party needs, uh, for example, to uh, be willing to tolerate uh, decisions that go against it, to allow, if you will, more room for civil society and university and media criticism, uh, to loosen the organs that tie the uh, party to the judiciary. Um, will this happen? Uh, will the 18th Party Congress produce leadership that will be more amenable? As Joe said, awfully hard to know, not just the next three weeks, but really the next many years. Uh, on the hopeful sign, uh, many societies in East Asia have moved over time from first a military leadership to then leadership by engineers. Now, I know President Carter had some training as an engineer, so I want to be careful not to criticize engineers, to uh, leadership by lawyers. Um, Taiwan has followed this path, um, South Korea and other societies. And in the next set of leadership in the 18th Party Congress, Li Keqiang, who is the likely uh, prime Minister is the first person with formal legal training to assume a position of high rank in the Chinese leadership. Who knows what he will be like? It is said, but there's no confirmation that he helped intervene recently to uh, protect a professor at Beijing University, his alma mater, who is very critical of the authorities. Hu Wei Fang, right, who is coming in a couple of weeks to the US. Uh, so that is, if you will, a hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, just to briefly conclude, mm -hmm. Uh, it's really a test uh, for the party, it seems to me. Um, the legal institutions will not begin to serve the purpose that is intended, which, as Joe said, with uh, a vast number of demonstrations and civil disturbances, ideally, as a ruler, you would like people to take their legitimate grievances off the street and bring them to uh, uh, organized governmental channels, courts, uh, for resolution when you have, in a society changing in the profound way China is, with 275 million people having left the countryside and moved to the cities in the last 20 or 30 years, it's as if all of Western Europe had left, uh, with tremendous change economically and socially and engagement with the larger world, there will be lots of social dislocation and turmoil. You therefore need channels to uh, absorb in a legitimate way those uh, uh, grievances. And so will the party, will the party state give enough autonomy to the courts and other institutions that people feel they can get a fair hearing, a fair shake, a decision that's on the merits? Or will the party feel so constrained to hold on to power that people will not have faith in these institutions and 
as Joe suggested, take to the streets in increasing numbers. So, so the ultimate dilemma is, is, at the end of the day, a fairly straightforward one uh, in that type of choice. I'm going to ask, thanks, thanks very much, Bill. Ask, ask Yahweh, because he's been our eyes and ears in China for the last 15 years, and you've sort of felt these trends, and, and, and I think it might be appreciated by our Atlanta friends to hear a little bit about how you've seen it from a Carter Center perspective. Sure. Uh, I will begin with an unverified uh, anecdote. I'll make a comment, and then I have two questions for each of the two panelists. The, the unverified anecdote is when President Carter and Deng Xiaoping were negotiating a gentleman's uh, agreement, that is, how many students and scholars you're going to send from China, and President Carter said, well, for each uh, 5,000 students you're going to send, I'm going to send 5,000 American lawyers. And Deng Yaoping then said, no, we don't need American lawyers as much as we don't need American missionaries. I think both, <laughs> both groups of people are actually direly uh, needed uh, in, in China uh, at this particular point, uh, as both of them have uh, indicated. My comment is, is on Bo Xilai himself. I, I think I like uh, Bo Xilai. Not, I'm disgusted uh, by singing the right songs. I'm appalled by the Dahe anti-mafia campaign. I like him because of all the Chinese politicians, uh, he's the only one who made it very clear, you know, I want to go all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. And he was campaigning uh, for that post. And, and he had a systematic uh, policies, you know, sort of to answer, as Joe said, on, on the societal need. Obviously, I don't know the things that under the table, you know, he probably is a criminal. His wife killed a British businessman. And he turned the Chinese politics upside down. And, and he totally uh, weakened the party's uh, legitimacy. But again, I think China does need politicians like Bo Xilai in a way that you have to openly campaign uh, for office. You have to represent who you are representing. You need to make it clear to the people. Now, my two questions, uh, first uh, to Joe, is are there going to be more surprises you know, with the party congress uh, to be convened on November the 8th? You know, in 2002, there were two surprises. One, uh, Jiang Zemin stayed on as chairman of the Central Military Commission. Two, uh, the standing committee of the Politburo suddenly was expanded from seven to nine. Now, in 2007, there was a huge surprise. Uh, that is, Xi Jinping was helicoptered all the way uh, to the successor stage. So any more surprises, as you can see? And, and for Bill, uh, the question is, I think uh, Joe mentioned 180,000 mass incident, averaging 500 per day. Uh, there is an argument uh, which says these mass incidents actually are doing a good thing, mm -hmm. not for the local government, but for the central government. Because if the local government doesn't do it well, then the central government can intervene. So there's always uh, the, uh, if you poll Chinese people, do you like local government officials? They will say no. But if they say, do you like the top leaders? They say, yes, we like them. Because, you know, sort of this detached approach in, in, in response to these mass incidents. So I'll leave these two questions for you two guys. Oh, the nice, easy questions about the uh, surprises <laughs> that you can uh, catch me on in three weeks. Uh, we've already had some surprises. Uh, you know, normally the general secretary goes out to the party school and gives a speech in May that uh, adumbrates the themes of the upcoming party congress. Uh, Hu Jintao waited until July 23rd to give such a speech, and it was briefer than speeches in the past. Uh, the meetings of Bei Dai He, the summer resort that's on the the coast, uh, the Bohai Gulf there, uh, seems to have ended without much resolution. Uh, and that was a bit of a surprise, because you're supposed to be able to cut deals. Uh, I don't want to get too inside baseball, especially with the World Series starting tonight. Uh, but uh, Ling Jihua is a very close to Hu Jintao, the general secretary, uh, and was just a couple of weeks ago very suddenly removed from his office uh, well, his son got into a traffic accident, and he happened to have been driving a Ferrari, which raised questions about where his allowance came from. Uh, at any case, uh, I mean, unfortunately, he died, and that's, that's tragedy. But, you know, in other words, there's been these very sudden changes that we've seen already. Uh, are we going to see more? Uh, certainly when they reveal the list of the Politburo itself, not the standing committee that we've all been focused on, 
There are bound to be surprises. Uh, the, there are 25 members of the Politburo, including the Standing Committee. There will be seven or possibly nine, if there's a real surprise, uh, coming out on the stage on November uh, 16th, I believe. Uh, that leaves 16 members of the Politburo that are not on the Standing Committee. Only, um, only nine of them will be carried over. The others retire because of uh, age. That's an awful lot of seats to fill. And that's going to tell us, I think, a little bit about which way China is going to go and what types of leaders that they have been uh, decided to promote. And so I suspect we'll find some big surprises and some small surprises in that list. Thank you. So for, uh, first, uh, if I could pick up on Yahweh's anecdote. Uh, so I uh, once went to uh, brief uh, President Carter before uh, one of his trips after he was president, one of his trips to China, and he was telling this story about swapping Chinese people for American lawyers. And he looked at me and he said, well, lawyers and people, two separate categories. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Carter was so polite, she turned and said, Jimmy, I think Professor Alford is a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, your question's a good one. So about uh, local uh, demonstrations. And so there is a, a long historical pattern in China of believing that even if the local officials were uh, rather venal, that if only the emperor knew, if only the authorities in Beijing knew, everything would be fine. And indeed, uh, that's underlying your question. I, I guess I... I um, would push back on that. I'm a little skeptical myself. I mean, I think the issues are challenges for China, and this is not a view that's unique to me or Joe Fusmith or Yahweh or others, uh, is that the great challenges really are institutional challenges, how to build better mm -hmm. and stronger institutions. Institutions in China that are commensurate with the richness of Chinese civilization, one of the world's great civilizations, 5,000 years of history and culture, and China's economic greatness and power. And I am struck by the steady stream of officials and uh, Chinese intellectuals and others I uh, meet in my work. Either they come through uh, Harvard and they want to talk, or I'm in China. And behind closed doors, a lot of you know, very bright officials of not trivial position will say, you know, we just need to improve our institutions so that they are more effective. We understand these are our challenges. One of them said to me, it's like trying to repair the airplane while you're flying it. Mm -hmm. This is not easy. But I therefore think that um, somehow it, uh, it maybe misses a, a little uh, the nature of the challenge to think that it's just the local officials somehow are off on a tangent or errant, and somehow if only Beijing knew, everything would be fine. I think uh, the challenge is a greater one. You know, you might say a word, uh, since you've been following, and I hope our, our audience follows our website and chinaelections.net, but what's the traffic been like, the social networking about these issues? It, it's becoming a broader debate, I take it, in China, but then it gets constrained, like we're constrained right now. Uh, I think uh, social media itself is a, a new kid uh, on the block. It, it is changing uh, the format through which the government and the people, the society and the state are interacting uh, with each other. Uh, our website, uh, chinaelection.org, actually was forced into an involuntary furlough uh, April the 8th uh, because we speculated on the party congress, as we are doing now, and we can freely talk about it, but in China, uh, that, that's forbidden. Uh, I myself have, have a Weibo, and uh, I, I don't know. I have over 300,000 followers, but I was told uh, 98 of them are uh, fake. Uh, followers, what they call Jiang Shi Fen Si. So I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I do uh, speculate, I continue to speculate uh, on the party congress. And uh, I get censored uh, a few times. But uh, I, I think the way that I'm able to talk through the, the Chinese Twitter is indicative that there, are, I think, as two professors have mentioned, there is this societal push uh, for change. And, and even those who work. Uh, for the government uh, are very much aware that these voices, complaints, needs to be allowed to bubble to the surface. Otherwise, you know, I think you use the, the metaphor, you try to fix the plane while it, you're flying. Uh, in China, I think Wang Yang uh, has a better metaphor. He said it's like a frog in a slow cooker. 
So yes. The, the, the frog doesn't feel anything, but when it is too heat, then it's going to explode and, and the frog mm -hmm. is going to mm -hmm. die. I think that, that's the uh, dilemma that the government is facing. I'm, right I'm, now. I'm, I'm sensitive that we have about 15 more minutes before we go to questions and answers, and it would be good to talk a bit about China's place in the world and the way in which domestic and foreign poli politics and affairs interact within China and what we're understanding of that. Do you? Any of you want to pick up on, on, on getting into this uh, domain of uh, Ch China's global role? That, that's a really uh, big, big, big and complicated question. It is. Um, you know, I, I think that China has gotten a little bit of a bad reputation in the last couple of years, which they've brought upon themselves to a certain extent about being very aggressive or assertive in foreign policy. And uh, if you've been reading about the conflicts in the South China Sea, and the um, uh, recent conflicts over uh, the Senkaku Diaoyutai Islands in the East China Sea. And th I think the point is there are certainly some very more nationalistic voices in China, including in the military, uh, mostly retired and hence not reflecting China's official stance, but reflecting certainly a, a sentiment within the, the armed forces. And that's sort of new stuff that we haven't seen before. Uh, but my sense is that China is not so much going out and looking for conflict as it is you know, finding conflict and then not being able to deal with it mm -hmm. very well. Uh, and that's where the, the conflictual nature, both of society and of elite politics, means that they tend to have very loud responses to these conflicts. And particularly in the run-up to the 18th Party Congress, nobody can be soft especially on Japan, given the, the very long and bitter history between those two countries. Well, that, that, that's helpful. And they are in a lot of international organizations yes. and regimes. So, so China is feeling its way mm -hmm. in a lot of international, it seems to me, in a lot of international organizations as its uh, wealth and power and, and consequence uh, has increased so greatly. So, for example, in organizations like the World Trade Organization, uh, China it, it hasn't yet in many regards, I think, fully made up its mind about how it wishes to use its power. Mm -hmm. But the broader issue of development, developing countries, you see something of the same. China, um, for uh, decades, had uh, solidarity with developing countries. And now that China is both the second largest economic power in the world, but still, in some respects, a developing country, I still sense a kind of ambivalence. And so uh, you think of China and Africa, an area that uh, the Carter Center under Yahweh's leadership is studying. And uh, China is a huge player in Africa, and it's going to have an incredibly important role. It's already beginning to. And you know, what will be the balance between uh, simply serving China's immediate interest, strategic interest in getting raw materials and uh, playing a constructive role in African development, a concern that should be germane for anybody in the world? Mm -hmm. And so we don't really know yet. I mean, so far uh, in Africa, uh, it's been more the strategic domestic interests that play. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty and, uh, and partly mm -hmm. driven by the challenges at home that make it hard. Uh, uh, and partly the prominence and the power is still, you know, it's very new for China. It, it, it certainly, it, it's what's our, but in our experience, and we've we found, for example, in our election observation work in Africa, that when you have these coalitions of the international community supporting the self-determination through the ballot box in countries like Guinea or Cote d'Ivoire, the Chinese are with the rest of the international community. So I like to show this picture of a ballot box in Guinea, which has a picture of the Chinese flag on it, and say to the Chinese, you know, you're doing very well in supporting elections in Africa, maybe. Yahweh, China elections. Uh... <laughs> you know, China observed elections in many, many places in Burma, you know, in, in other uh, countries. But I think uh, you know, the rise of economic China is making China all over the, the map. I guess mm -hmm. no continent now can say we don't need China or we don't like China. They all like China. They need China. But the rise of political China is a different uh, issue. Mm -hmm. I think during the, the Romney and uh, Obama debate, the last debate on foreign policy, you know, Romney apparently is very good at the statistic. He said, United States has 42 allies in the world. And of course, the next question for those Chinese who are watching this debate is, how many allies does China have? Hmm. And uh, of course, China believes in a non-aligned uh, movement. But even those uh, that champion non-aligned movement right now have issues with, with China. 
And I was doing uh, homework for, for today, so I read an a article right by Francisco Sisi, an Italian. And, and he basically said, how does China project power and influence to the outside world when the most important political event of your country, which is the choice of your leaders for the next five to 10 years, is hidden? not only from your own people, but also from the outside world. How, how can you project your power and influence? It, it makes people nervous. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a word, by the way, given the mysteries of, uh, of US politics, that you're bringing Chinese observers over to watch our election this year? <laughs> well, uh, we are bringing about 20 some uh, Chinese scholars, officials, and particularly those uh, who are good uh, online with the Chinese uh, Twitter. So they will be in Chicago, they will be in Lafayette, Indiana, they will be in Tucson, Arizona, they will be in Seattle, and we also have Tencent, the Tengxin people following uh, these people, so we're, we're going to do uh, real-time citizen reporting of what's happening on the ground here uh, in the U.S. I, I guess, you know, uh, the Chinese, uh, while they love their country, uh, they think China needs to rise. At the same time, there is the sharp contrast because both countries are going through a leadership change. Whereas the change here, uh, you know, we don't like how the campaign is run, but at least we know the differences and we know the consequences. You know, if Romney uh, is going to be elected, I think John will move back to South Africa. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'm going to write my second book, uh, you know, <laughs> Romney, the man who will change America. Uh, but uh, on the other side is, all the citizens are told, be ready to xiin, you know, welcome, warmly welcome the party congress, but you're not allowed uh, to, to make a comment on that. On that. I, I think uh, that is, is posing a sharp contrast uh, to the Chinese, but also the election will have uh, impact on US-China relationship. You know, whoever is gonna be elected, even though at this point we don't see much policy differences from both candidates, uh, but uh, who knows? I, I think uh, a very famous Chinese uh, uh, American watcher said we would like to have Romney in the White House uh, because we're not gonna have any illusions. We know what he wants to do, so it's relatively easy. Then to deal with, you know, sort of uh, Democrats, you know, who are not always uh, clear in what they want to do. Although oh, oh, I, you know, if I could slight. <laughs> Slightly disagree. Uh, I, I think um, the rhetoric from both President Obama and Governor Romney was quite similar in the debate about China. And I think post-election, they each will move, in, whoever would move in a somewhat similar direction. Because I think the larger, uh, this is a point not original with me, but uh, Lee Kuan Yew made many years ago, the larger geopolitical yeah. constraints were such center, right? that, uh, former uh, head of Singapore, that um, the the running room, the choices are not are not profound. So I think if Governor Romney is elected, it's unlikely that he will be as harsh uh, in retribution toward China as he's suggesting in the campaign. And even even if President Obama is reelected, I also suspect there'll be uh, some moderation. But maybe I could raise one point, which is uh, one thing that the Obama foreign policy team did in the election was keep Obama from locking himself into hardline rhetoric. And so he didn't have to walk it back. Uh, Romney has already Romney locked, himself, has locked right? himself in. I was surprised in the debate the other night that he repeated his comment that on the first day in office mm. he would declare China a, a currency, currency, currency manipulator. manipulator because China is going to respond with a trade war on the second day. And I would like to have heard the question of what Romney is going to do on the third day. But <laughs> <laughs> right. But. Um, the uh, declaration that China is, uh, if indeed there is a Romney presidency and he makes this declaration, it actually doesn't do anything other than essentially trigger a requirement to have negotiations, which they've been having for many a year. So yeah. it's more rhetorical uh, than real. And I think, although you're right that the Obama team has been more careful about its rhetoric, uh, the trade cases that have been brought this year, which are serious yeah, cases, yeah. certainly, and many of them with some merit, nonetheless have been viewed, uh, you know, sure. are, are seen as poking China in the eye to a degree. Sure. I, and I think I, the Chinese, frankly, could probably live with either Yeah, choice. I want to add the recent Pew research on Chinese attitude toward America. 
uh, is is declining. The positive view of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. I think about 64 percent uh, of of the Chinese uh, either sees U.S. as non-cooperative or uh, sees U.S. as totally hostile to China. So it, it, you know I think it's hard to explain what is uh, actually taking place inside China in terms of their view mm -hmm. of the United States. They continue to try to come over here to study. Many of them uh, choose to, to stay here. Uh, but at the same time, the top leadership uh, seems to believe uh, that the United States uh, has an intention and also a capability to slow down, if not to destroy uh, the rise of China. I often uh, hear that where Chinese uh, uh, visitors will suggest that the US has a, a, something of a plot to try to stem the rise of China. and I only respond to that by saying, have you ever spent time in Washington? Can you, <laughs> do you read the newspapers? The idea that the U.S. could, could, could get that organized right. mm -hmm. <laughs> is rather remote. I, I do the same thing, but it's very hard to convince them there is no such a plot. I, I think they truly believe that there is such they a plot. They have grown 10 percent a year for 30 years. If we have such a plot, right, exactly. it's not very mm -hmm. effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the world is a very complicated place. I mean, one of the great advantages of being at the Carter Center is that we're spread out in areas that are of growing, growing interest to China. And because we have good relations or try to have good relations with China, we can engage them in a dialogue about a, what a win-win would look like because it's a complicated world. We need to have the cooperation multilaterally in Africa, in the Middle East. China was with us on, on, on Libya and is, is sanctions on Iran. And I think that habit of cooperation can be accelerated perhaps after our two elections. I mean, that's the hope, because we've only got a couple of more minutes before going to questions. And, and, and I know our crystal ball is a little hazy because we didn't get the party Congress right. But does anyone want to add anything by way of uh, inspiring, particularly our students, to uh, dedicate their lives to working on China? What else would you work it? on? Well, there is a good question. <laughs> I mean, this is really one of the great issues of the age. Yes. And there are uh, a lot of important questions around the world, but certainly none of them are more important than China. So it, yeah. so, so I think when both Joe and I uh, started to study China, people thought uh, th there was no future in it. I right. was certainly told that by uh, many a family member. Uh, <laughs> not immediate family, but uncles and aunts, what would you possibly do for a living, right? Um, but I think Joe's right. It's extraordinarily important in itself, this profound and huge social experiment that China's doing. But also, even if your primary interest isn't China, my own sense very much is that no global order, no global regime, will work without serious Chinese participation. If we're talking about climate control, human rights, trade, immigration, drug trafficking, disease. So if, if those are your interests, uh, development, development in poor parts of the world, none of this is going to happen unless the Chinese and the Americans, among others, are on board. If China is resistant in any yeah. major way to any of these regimes, they're just not going to be fully successful. So I think there are a lot of good reasons. And as Yahweh said, there are 100 in 57,000 Chinese youth here studying our country. I will often say to my American students, you better work really hard because you see these Chinese students who are here, their English is absolutely terrific. They're doing law in a second language and doing extremely well. And if we're going to be in a world where we're in a healthy way going to uh, compete or cooperate with them, we, we really best uh, work pretty hard ourselves. We, we have held the world hostage to our domestic politics for a long time. We might have normalized relations with China after the revolution in 49 if the white paper had been released, maybe and people had seen that there was a possibility of uh, a meaningful bilateral relations, but our domestic politics wouldn't allow Truman, I think, to go down that road. And now China is being constrained by its own domestic politics. So as the Chinese learn about our domestic politics, it's incumbent upon us to learn about their domestic politics. And it's harder, of course, because it's less transparent. And it is less transparent, but it's becoming more and more mysterious as it becomes more transparent, because that's the nature of democratic politics. Uh, no secrets, but plenty of mystery. Right. Uh, I think if we can get uh, audience members to uh, uh, step forward, if you do have questions for our panelists, we're uh, right on schedule for the next uh, uh, 30 minutes or so of questions and answers. If, uh, if those of you would like to uh, uh, come to the microphone, please do so. And when you do, please identify yourself and try to make your, con your, your questions brief, because I see there's a growing line now. But um, this woman to my 
eyesight to the right here of me is, is, is uh, uh, first up, so please direct your questions to any of us or Hi, to them. Hi, um, my name's Jan Hackney, and uh, thank you for being here tonight. I think this is a very important issue, and as a woman, I'm very concerned about women's rights, and um, I'd be interested in hearing your views um, on how China can resolve the aftermath of their one-child rule mm -hmm. and their high ratio of men to women. Um, there was a documentary out a few weeks ago, uh, Half the Sky, and also a book that Nicholas Kristof mm -hmm. and his wife wrote, and it addresses sex trafficking in Asia and uh, in parts all over the world. And um, I was just wondering how China can focus on this dilemma for women's rights and women's welfare. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think it's an extraordinarily important one, of course, not just for, for, for women, but for everyone, for everyone, right? Uh, uh, the one-child policy is, is really uh, a huge burden for China. It already, uh, the population ratio of uh, boy to girl babies is wildly skewed. And indeed, there are very good Chinese demographers, very brave Chinese demographers, who say it's much worse in the countryside even than reported. Uh, it also has led to a huge, bur obviously, discrimination if, if uh, uh, baby girls are either not uh, uh, fed well or inoculated against disease or, um, in some cases, infanticide, uh, but a huge burden in many other ways. I mean, the so-called uh, uh, one, two, four phenomenon where there's a single child supporting in old age two parents or four grandparents. So I think there's a lot of push in China to try to move away from that. It's not necessarily all that well enforced in many parts of the country, but it's a profound issue. I myself think that the solution suggested by Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist who's a professor at Harvard, has a lot to it. And he says, if you look at India, you see that uh, increasing educational opportunities for women and employment opportunities actually does bring down the birth rate, but in a much, much less uh, uh, coercive manner. Thank you. I, I would just add, you know, could I just add that the Chinese political system itself is just horribly gender biased. Uh, what, at the last Central Committee, there were 4%, 6%, something like that, of women. That's a ridiculously low percentage. There's one woman on the Politburo now. No woman has ever attained Politburo Standing Committee status. Um, it's just, you know, that, the, to the extent that the political system is going to take up and think about these issues, uh, I think women need to be promoted at different levels of the political system. And, and you're right, I mean, I'm to say this, this, this panel is not very representative either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all it against you. Um, my name is Krista. I'm here with the U.S. China People's Friendship Association of Atlanta. I actually have seven questions, but I'll stick with one. Uh, this is for Dr. Thank Alford. Thank you. You spoke about building institutions, especially the judicial institution, as being a major part of uh, long-term change in China. Do you see also building institutions such as the FDA that we have here, or EPA? Uh, those are also very important. Do you think with slowing growth in China and the drive to keep that growth high, do you think that will hold back the development of things such as the EPA and the FDA in, in a Chinese context? So the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, it would be an important example. So in China, there are some very, very brave and creative and thoughtful both officials and uh, private citizens who work on environmental issues. And they haven't really prevailed because the drive to uh, uh, grow materially has been so profound. And why is that? Well, part of the allegiance to the party is based on providing people a better life materially. But I think it's absolutely indispensable for, for China to begin to do that. How will it happen? Well, there's talk that if there were in the cadre, cadres are evaluated, and if there were in the country evaluation metric more attention than there now is to issues of environment, that might be, might be an impetus. But I think important for China, important for all of us. I should quickly add, though, um, one response I sometimes get from Chinese uh, uh, interlocutors, which I think has some merit, is they say, well, you know, in America, you guys grew, and mm -hmm. you were inattentive to that, and you still uh, emit more carbon you know, gases than we do, so it's a little bit hypocritical for you to tell us now. So I do think it's an area where the two countries need to, to work more together. I would just add food safety, which has become a tremendously um, important issue in China, and you hear a lot of chatter mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, think back to the progressive era when we began to develop 
professional associations and, and a real regulatory mechanism. That's where China needs it, it is, is this whole regulatory regime. I think that these two regulatory agencies are also the most corrupt uh, in yes. China. There's just a report that the Zhejiang Provincial uh, FDA uh, chief was arrested, uh, just cash at his house, 50 million RMB from, from his house. It, it's just, if you look at all the heads of FDA or road building agencies, you know, every single one of them, you can just basically arrest them, summarily execute them, no question asked. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And well, I, I don't no think rule of law here. That's probably not the, 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 model. Right. There was a famous example a few years ago where the head of the uh, Chinese FDA was executed to yeah. send a message. I don't actually think that's a constructive uh, <laughs> institution. Uh, so do we have another simple question here? Um, I was reading an article recently about... And, and your name, please? Uh, oh, sorry. My name's Evangelista. Uh, I was reading an article recently about the woman on the Politburo and how she could possibly make the standing committee. If Liu Yandong makes the standing committee, uh, what do you think could possibly be the consequences of that? Well, I think we're safe. I don't think she'll make the Politburo standing committee. Unless it's expanded to nine, right? It, she, it, maybe the 11. Right. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, 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 you know, Liu Yandong seems to be a very capable woman. She has good ties to both the so-called Princeling group as well as the so-called uh, uh, China Youth League group. It's still not enough to get her elevated. Uh, and um, gee, I, I think that would have been a great example for China. Question over here. Yun Chen. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Welburn, and I'm a retired professor of history at Clayton State University here in Atlanta. Uh, how are judges selected in China, and by whom? Hmm. And must judges be party members? So it is. I do. You know, nobody on the outside knows for sure, but it is said that uh, virtually all judges are are party members. Uh, now, to be fair, the quality of training is is quite different than it was in the past, and there are more and more judges here, graduates of. Uh, of leading Chinese universities or have done training with the, what's called the Fakwa Shiyuan, which is a sort of Judges National Institute. Uh, and you see examples of younger judges um, trying to uh, um, really demonstrate more professionalism. Having said that, I was giving a talk about this and a, a very successful Chinese lawyer in the audience said, well, Professor Alford, the result of all this further education is that now Judges, if they're going to be corrupt and throw a case, they will go. They will be able to write a better opinion, sort of covering their <laughs> their tracks. Uh, but but I think that's probably still a little unfair. I mean, I do think you see signs of serious, you know, the emergence of professionals within the party context uh, among young Chinese judges. I'm going to go upstairs for a question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Tong Zhao. I'm a student from Georgia Tech. Um, in your previous discussion, you have touched upon the issue of the importance of reducing uh, misunderstanding between U.S. and China, or in other words, uh, uh, trust building between the two countries. Um, some people say that the two countries have different approaches of building trust. Uh, the Chinese way is top-down, which means they want to the top political leadership to make a commitment to improve the relationship, and then they can uh, push things forward at the practical levels. But the American approach is uh, bottom-up, which means they want to work from the very uh, practical level and then build trust at the practical level and then hope that trust will uh, spill over to the uh, upper levels. So I was wondering, what's your take on these two different approaches of trust building and what are the pros and cons for each of the two approaches? Thank you. I guess I would do both. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we have such a complicated, multi-layered uh, relationship with China now that it's no longer, in the old days, you know, Nixon could go to China and shake hands with Mao Zedong and you had a deal. Um, these days, the, the relationship is just so complex. You mentioned the 150,000 students who are here. Uh, that's building a relationship. Uh, you know, the, the various delegations of lawyers and even professors 
who go over there um, that, that build relations at that level. Negotiations over all sorts of economic, the private enterprises and so forth that are so extensively engaged. Um, I don't think that you can do one or the other. I think it's just such an enormously complex relationship. You have to do it all at once. Yes, sir. Hi there. My name is Charles Boyd. I am a history major at Oglethorpe University. And probably my biggest area, of, well, definitely my biggest area of interest is civil rights. And what my question is, is from what I have gathered about the legal status of gay and lesbian uh, Chinese people, it seems to be not as uh, bad legally for them as it is in, say, Iran or Saudi Arabia, but also definitely not as good as, say, Norway or even Israel or perhaps the United States. But my question is, does China seem to be making any progress in, in terms of gay and lesbian citizens having more rights, or is that issue pretty stagnant there right now? Bill, that's your question. Yeah. So uh, with the, if I may start with a quick anecdote. When I first, uh, when my second trip to China in 1979, it was with a group of ethicists from the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. We were in Shanghai, and one of the um, ethicists asked uh, about the gay population, and the, our Chinese host, this is 1979, our Chinese host said, there are none. There's nobody in the city who is gay. And so uh, uh, we reacted with a little surprise. We then adjourned for lunch. And after lunch, our Chinese host, seeing that we were surprised, came back and said, we wish to make a correction. There is one gay citizen here. <laughs> and I'm scratching my head thinking, oh, that seems really odd. But anyway. Uh, uh, at least two. Huh? Yeah, right, right. Uh, they didn't, the word gay wasn't used, of course. Now. Um, uh, it's a different China, and so there is actually a not insubstantial uh, uh, sort of underground in Beijing and Shanghai. And I've have met and know well uh, one of the gay rights activist lawyers, who's a very clever guy who figures out how far you can go as a, a rights activist without getting in trouble, and he has great sense of humor, so he stays on the good side of people. Uh, but it's not really so much an issue of uh, gay rights in our sense and more kind of a, a more implicit beginning of more tolerance and acceptance in, in major Chinese cities. My guess would be if you went into the countryside, you would still discover a, a good deal more resistance. Thank you. Up, upstairs, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Susan Mwape. I'm from Zambia. I'm working with Common Cause here in Georgia. Um, it's been a very interesting uh, conversation that you're having down there, and I'd like to find out what the effects of the domestic political situation in, in China is going to have on the world and also in Africa, because China is a big deal in Africa. I come from Zambia, a country where our current president, during his campaign period, promised to chase the Chinese away. And um, yeah, barely, uh, barely one, a week later, he was hosting a big banquet for the Chinese. Over 100 Chinese people were invited to State House. So the, the effect of China in terms of disregarding labor laws, killing people, and things like that. We even had a case where a Chinese national was killed by uh, local miners because of the injustices of cutting people's ears and things like that. So what effects would that have, especially on Africa? Thank you. That, that's our project. <laughs> uh, we're, we're trying to find out exactly uh, the relationship between China and African countries. So we know uh, the perception of the Chinese people is that we're there to help uh, the Africans to develop their economy, to build up the infrastructure. Uh, but what the Chinese don't know uh, is how these Chinese efforts are being perceived. Zambia being, being the case. I grew up uh, in the years when we were hungry but the government decided to build the Zambia-Tanzania mm -hmm. uh, railroad that we're really supporting. And I think the Chinese also needed African countries for their votes in the United Nations and elsewhere. And now I think there's also the need for resources, oil, uh, copper, uh, and other things from Africa. And also African continent is a big uh, market. 
However, that relationship is very uh, complex. It's no longer a political relationship. It is an economic relationship. It is a, a, a relationship of, of security arrangement, but there's more to it. Uh, for, for China to sustain its presence, for China not to engage the United States on the African continent in a quasi-Cold War, uh, China needs to do a lot more uh, to integrate more into the communities, to let uh, Africans exactly know what they're doing there, and to drop that sense of uh, condescension that we're here uh, to help you. Uh, and uh, so, it, it, again, it's a good question. It's a complex relationship. Uh, we are uh, looking into it, and Zambia is all, actually our case study. Right. I, I was in Lusaka last year and talked to the Chinese ambassador in Lusaka, and he's perfectly aware of the political histories and the conflicts surrounding the election, but also that the elected president who ran against China immediately reached out to build bridges to China once he was in office. That's a bond the successor. And your compatriot there, Ms. Moyo, has written this wonderful book, Dead Aid, on aid in China and, and China's role in Africa, which is the biggest story since independence for a lot of us believe. You can now drive from Cairo to Cape Town on Chinese-built roads, except for about 100 or 200 kilometers somewhere in the central part of the continent. So it, it is an enormously important story that, uh, that Yahweh rightly points to, and I hope you'll uh, come talk to us sometime about your impressions. Uh, yes, please. My name is Richard Danner. Uh, I, have a, I feel it's a very naive question, but I need an explanation. Uh, corruption seems to be so pervasive and obviously very unproductive for the country. So why don't the upper echelons of the CPC crack down more uh, they do on when scandals hit and heads roll then but I, with their power I just think they could draw the line even at the local level and and yet nothing is done corruption is rampant that's a naive question I like to see a hard question you got to give a naive answer <laughs> <laughs> well it's a, it's a complex uh, question uh, there are basically three answers at the local level. One, as both Bill and I have said, there's a lack of institutions that could make local officials accountable to the local population to reduce the abuse of power. Two, uh, which goes along with that, local party secretaries at the county, township level, really are all powerful within their jurisdictions. So there are no constraints. And three is the temptations and the rewards are incredible. Uh, Bill just mentioned the uh, a figure on, on land. Uh, well, my figure on land it was, comes from 05. 163,000 hectares of land were sold in China, one-third by market mechanisms at auction, two-thirds under the table, striking deals. The two-thirds, the price of the land, was four to five times, mm -hmm. five million renminbi per hectare on average. That temptation combined with that power, and of course that land comes from the peasant, so there's the explanation of why the peasants aren't happy. But you know, you combine opportunity with great temptation, um, I think it's an explanation for corruption wherever you go. Yeah, and a legal system which is still to be developed. Yeah. yeah. There isn't really a fully, in, uh, local courts are very dependent on local units of government, which in turn are dependent on local factories and local real estate developers. So, so it, it, independence really is crucial. Yes, please. What is China's current policy regarding refugees, both those entering China and, both, and those leaving China, especially in regard to non-governmental organization involvement and social reintegration? of these refugees into society, the society that they are living in, and what do you think future progress in this area would be in China? Mm. China doesn't recognize refugees, does it? Uh, no, I, I don't think China recognizes refugees. There are refugees from North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, but China but, doesn't recognize that. And they're so sent back if they're caught. They're, they're sent back, and, and so that, that's the thing. There are also North Koreans in China who would scale the wall, get into a foreign embassy, right. so that they could go somewhere else. So. I think the Chinese uh, helped uh, settling some of the refugees from Vietnam uh, and the other parts, but largely, I think. But, but there's been no large settlement of refugees or no refugee camps or anything right. like no. that. 
Um, not, not since their Vietnam War. Oh, all when right. Yeah, well, Chinese yeah, uh, when, when Chinese yeah. Uh, and, repatriated, right, if you will. Right. One of the great ironies is China is a very revolutionary state, but it's a very conservative state now and international, and it doesn't mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. interfere in the internal affairs of other states it constantly uh, proclaims. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real puzzle to unscramble. Jeremy, it's nice to see Carter Center interns here tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. My name is Jeremy, and I'm an intern with the Conflict Resolution Program. And I have a question for all of you that as a mediator, what are some ways or some strategies that you would recommend to engage Chinese firms who find themselves on the ground, say in Africa, that um, on the ground in conflict zones? What, what are some ways that you would engage a Chinese firm? I have no answer for that question. Uh, to engage them to do what? I'm not quite sure. To, to better integrate themselves with the in conflict zones? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of Sudan in particular. You know, there's a lot of human rights violations going on all around. And yeah. um, a key part of the conflict is over oil. But China has, is the builder of all the oil infrastructure processing facilities mm -hmm. in Sudan. Right. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people here that know that situation better than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the, the oil investment came really from the oil companies. It wasn't part of state strategy. Uh, and it was only when they got in there and all of a sudden there were accusations of a genocide, Olympics, then the government said, oh, we have a problem. And then they began to uh, pay attention and actually distanced themselves from Bashir and built ties with southern Sudan. And if I'm not mistaken, China supported the creation of an independent southern Sudan state, mm -hmm. which is a very to, contrary yeah. to what they've done traditionally. Within uh, the mainstream, uh, that's absolutely correct. And, and it, what we're seeing now is the Chinese pragmatism prevailing in a constructive way in support of the peace process because they have an interest, as we all do, in getting the oil flowing and some stability and not going back to war. So that if you're um, a status quo power, as China is now to a large extent, wants to have stability so it can get on with business, getting conflicts resolved peacefully is in everyone's interest. And so I, I think they can be a reliable partner, and that's something that should be reinforced. Mm -hmm. And getting them a seat at the table becomes very important. So uh, I appreciate that. Yes, young man. Um, hello, my name is Nicholas Nasser. And concerning the legal code and the horrible, um, as you talked about, Dr. Simpson, the horrible legal abuses with the local government and how 99% of petitions from Chinese people are denied, However, you also said that there were promising reforms and progress for the Chinese legal code and how people were learning more and more. And my question is, as the common people are learning more about the Chinese legal code, this will inevitably cause social tension because they'll realize there's certain rights that they're not being given. So my question is regarding the new leadership of China and what do you think would be the most important policy or the most progressive policy they could implement to alleviate some of the tensions created by the abuse of the legal system. Hey, whoa, I'd like to sign you up for my law school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> where, where, where are you in school? Where are you in school? Say that again, please. In oh, school? I'm North Cop High, North Cop High School. Okay, thank you. Wow, that's a great question. So, so I think one of the challenges for the Chinese government is as one creates a legal code that, or legal codes uh, that uh, imbue people at least formally on paper with rights and various Chinese laws, Chinese constitution have abundant rights articulated, some people begin to uh, take that very, very seriously. Uh, and so you get a fair amount of citizen uh, ferment and discontent. And so there are these amazing accounts. In fact, if you give me your email after the session, I'm happy to send you some more information about it, of, of um, urban people dislocated uh, by rapacious land developers, of workers in Chinese factories not provided the occupational safety uh, to which they're entitled by law, of ordinary people uh, seeking to use their rights. And so, so I, I find that a heartening sign. And I also see that there are Chinese officials who see this and you know, think there's two choices. Either you develop the system better to 
uh, vindicate you know, some of those rights, or eventually things really do boil over, uh, as in the frog example you mentioned. So I, I think a lot of it, it's a real test, and I think the next five years will show whether or not the legal institutions like the courts are given enough autonomy to uh, take, uh, make decisions, not in the big controversial cases, but in run-of-the-mill everyday life cases that are contrary to the seeming interest of powerful people or the party, but what law or justice requires. So I think you put your finger on the, maybe the biggest single challenge that they face from the, the area that I know about. Thank you. Keep in touch with them. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yes, please. Perfect. Hi there. My name is Chris Hendricks. Uh, I'm a student at Georgia State. And uh, Dr. Fusemith, you mentioned earlier how uh, Beaujolais had, I hope I pronounced that right, but. Very good. Uh, mm -hmm. He gained a lot of popularity through his uh, uh, policies, which were often Maoist or neo Maoist. And if there is a lot of popularity with Maoist and neo Maoist policies, could this mean that an expansion of democratization in China actually leads to a rolling back of the economic reforms? Well, I. I think you put your finger on uh, one of the really great change, uh, challenges of, mm -hmm. of the new leadership is which way do you lead China? Uh, and, you know, I think this is what Xi Jinping needs to decide. I think that you can say Xi Jinping has rejected the Bo Xilai approach for at least right now. There is substantial support for that out there. Uh, and I don't think we should forget that. That, that problem is going to come back. But I think that he, what he needs to do I hope that he does, is drive these reforms farther, deeper, mm -hmm. uh, because it's the uneven application of these reforms, uh, the half-reform society that leads to these inequities, these abuses of power. Um, I will say that this is, I don't usually talk about Tiananmen, uh, but this is the uh, hit shadow from Tiananmen, because when you embark on those sorts of reforms, you raise the issues that they grappled with 20 years ago. And part of the legacy of Tiananmen is, shh, we can't talk about those things. And I think now they're going to have to talk about those things. Can we go up to the balcony? Good evening. I'm Reverend Cameron Pennybacker. I direct Diversity Assets, a nonprofit which focuses on social justice, racial justice work. You alluded earlier to uh, a reciprocity needing to grow in our country regarding learning from China. In Macon, Georgia, we have recently hired our first black superintendent of schools. In his uh, two years into his three-year tenure, he has implemented a strategy of teaching all of our elementary age children Mandarin Chinese. Mm -hmm. I think he's highly influenced from reading Friedman more than once and um, looking at those economic forecasts and seeing how that uh, world has flattened. Um, that has met with uh, a not wholly unexpected response of uh, xenophobia. Hmm. And uh, so I, would you hazard uh, some advice at that very practical trust building uh, base level? Um, how do we build a hunger for that kind of uh, reciprocal learning and goodwill in our country among our young people as well as our corporate leaders? I think learning foreign languages is one of the best gifts you can give to our mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just don't think you can travel abroad or spend long times living abroad uh, as all of us have done um, and look at your own country quite the same way. Uh, you, you learn through these processes. I've, I've had this long standing, it's my bugabear, I think introducing foreign languages in the seventh grade, do seventh graders have something else on their minds? Um, so we I could ask my eighth grade people, daughter tonight. <laughs> we insist that people study foreign languages and we also persuade them never to learn them. Um, it's, it's a contradiction. You have to introduce languages at the elementary school level when students really do want to absorb all sorts of knowledge. So I think that I, I agree totally with Joe, I, and I often use the same language. It's a gift that a parent or a teacher can give a child. I think there, there, for arguments, there are both the idealistic arguments and very practical arguments. So was it YKK Zipper that was very big in Macon, Georgia? Yes, sir. Um, the Chinese are increasingly investing substantially in the United States. There are real disputes on the dollar value. Is it 
It ranged from $3 billion to about $11.5 billion wow. each year, but it's probably vastly more coming into the U.S. as wealth flows out of China. So if we're talking about jobs and competitiveness and future opportunity, uh, learning languages, certainly not just Chinese, but learning languages is really crucial, and Chinese is one of them. I myself would like, as my friend Joe, to premise it on more than just base practical considerations, but uh, I would invoke all arguments if I needed to. I want to, uh, I saw the report by ABC News, Diane Sawyer, on, on the main mm -hmm. story. I thought that was a very politicized, uh, biased uh, report. I, I thought the leader that uh, you mentioned actually had very good answer, saying this has nothing to do with politics. We want our kids to learn. We need teachers from China, and China send these teachers. I, I think from the grassroots level to the media and to the, the, the politicians, the, you know, both sides needs to depoliticize the learning process. Absolutely. You know, it's academic freedom. It has nothing to do with brainwashing. It has nothing to do mm -hmm. with the political propaganda. And let the teachers do their work. I feel Thank we have you. strong views up here. Yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is Dong Yu, uh, intern of the China program in the Carter Center, and I was also working as a law clinic assistant in China for three years. Um, so I was reading uh, news that saying that over 1.4 million uh, people are competing for less than 20,000 government uh, positions this year in China, and most of them are college, young college graduate students. So um, as I say, they, they are, ma many of them are attracted by the privilege in the government and of, uh, in the institutions. So uh, I think it's a dilemma here. For, for one, on one hand, the people, the, the, the young people, they are more liberal than, compared to their elder generation. They want to bring some new changes to the uh, institution. But on the other hand, they are attracted by their privilege and in the institution and want to become a part of it. So uh, what do you think, uh, what's your comments on this trend and how, do, how would it influence the future Chinese political culture? Thank you. It's, it's your cup of tea. Well, I think the good news is that most of them can't get those jobs and will have to find productive jobs. <laughs> and they happen to be very bright young people. I really am impressed with some of the talent that is in and coming out of Chinese colleges. Some of these people are just really, really smart, uh, and they work very, very hard. Uh, so on the one hand, I hope that it raises the level of Chinese bureaucrats. Uh, and as I say, if they don't get those jobs, they will have to go out and find jobs, whether it's NGOs or private sector, entrepreneurial type jobs, and that can only be good for China. So I don't worry too much about those who don't make it past that exam. Please. Good evening. My name is uh, Richard Wright. I'm an investigator with the United States Department of Labor. And specifically, I want to know, where is China as to labor law? Well, uh, China, China <laughs> why is everyone laughing? Yes, uh, China uh, has revised its labor law in the last couple of years, and they actually made it somewhat more stringent. It is interesting to see that foreign uh, uh, companies uh, sought to influence uh, lobby and sought to influence the shape of that law, and there was some battling between the U.S. and EU and the uh, um, the American Chamber of Commerce was uh, you know, arguing for somewhat uh, uh, less robust protections, would be a polite way to put it, uh, and the Europeans in a more European mode. Now, the Chinese labor law on its face uh, is, is uh, not bad, but there are some very substantial problems in reality in translating that into something meaningful. So what are they? So one is uh, there's not an independent labor union in China. That's probably the biggest single challenge. Now, of course, we live in the United States, so we're not exactly super robust in terms of membership and labor unions these days, but there, we do have independent unions, and that's just not the case in China. It's the single state uh, uh, union. That's the biggest challenge. Other challenges are just issues of enforcement that Professor Fusemith said pervade, correctly said pervade uh, environment, food safety, uh, you name it. And so um, there's a real challenge. Now, on the slightly more positive side, going back to this question from our wonderful high school student, uh, uh, Chinese workers are getting increasingly cognizant of what their rights are and are pushing more on the occupational safety side than they are on the uh, organizing union side. Obviously, that's much more politically dangerous. But 
it's not, people aren't rolling over totally. And there are, as you've read, I'm sure, in the papers, increasing numbers of uh, worker actions and some efforts to, by some employers to head that off by increasing wages and improving conditions some. The one-child policy, by the way, which I find very problematic, is in this regard already beginning to bear one of its few positive fruits, not a reason to keep it, but namely that in some areas there's actually a shortage of uh, skilled Chinese workers. I just add one more thing. I'm also from North Cobb. Thank you. <laughs> I think the high Gentlemen school. upstairs, uh, uh, been waiting a long time. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Paul. I'm from the Philippines. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, what are the common uh, attitude among the top uh, Chinese Politburo members, the top officials in particular, in dealing with the South China Sea issue? And uh, what is the prospect of having China uh, working with uh, neighbors, particularly Vietnam and the Philippines, in, in collaboratively uh, exploring the the energy resources in the South China Sea. You now, given, of course, the context that China is really ba badly, you know, trying to resolve its uh, issue of uh, energy crisis. Yeah, uh, this unfortunately has become a very nationalist issue in China, as it has in the Philippines mm -hmm. and Vietnam as well, and that makes it extremely difficult to resolve. Um, Hopefully, there's no oil there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> makes it a lot easier to resolve if there are no resources, right? Um, at any case, um, you know, the, you know, the, this has been election season in China, so it doesn't surprise quote me. Quote unquote, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Selection. Uh, yeah. selection season, yeah. uh, and and so as I say, it's very difficult for China to to back off or even to quiet down. Uh, when these sorts of issues come up. Um, China, I think, made a, made, uh, a really boneheaded decision uh, at the ASEAN meeting last year when they really sat on Cambodia to not have a ASEAN declaration that would support a code of conduct in the South China Sea. I mean, that's an obvious first step for China to take is to develop and cooperate with such a code of conduct so that when there are these disputes, sides are not sending out naval ships and God forbid somebody gets killed in one of these conflicts and then it becomes even more difficult to solve. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, th these things hit sovereignty issues and those are the most difficult to deal with. And so, you know, I think you just have to start step-by-step -step codes of conduct and try to quiet things down and develop rules of the road and, and hope that you can eventually address the sovereignty issues. Uh, I'm, I'm under uh, uh, orders and I have my boss, Dr. John Hardman, right in the front row here. So I'm supposed to, at, at 8.25, say there's time for one more question. But at the risk of being fired, I'm going to say, why don't you ask a question and why don't you ask a question and the last question up top very briefly, and we'll try to get the three answered right away, and I'll square that circle. So please, be very brief, and what's your question? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jillian Stark, and as you were talking about education in China earlier a little bit, um, and seeing it from a different perspective, last year I was an exchange student in Germany um, for most of the year, and so um, it really, like you said, gave me a perspective on the United States and the rest of the world and how it interacts with the rest of the world. So my question is, um, to what extent does China depend on education as a means of promoting um, better relations with both internally and externally with um, foreign states? And also, um, how does China invest in education to this? A big question, but what's your, do you have a quick question? My, uh, my question was regarding the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council. Yes. Which is what? What's your question? Oh, in regards to China, such as they have, um, as they increase their economic interests overseas and, uh, you know, especially in conflicted areas, I wanted to ask if any of you would see an evolution or if they would have a difference of opinion most of the time uh, as it will come to uh, voting in the Security Council. And the last question up at the top. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Elmadi Holly. I'm a um, program director for Southwest Atlanta Neighboring. 
Uh, I know a lot of this discussion is about commercial intervention uh, from U.S. to China, but are my questions more specific about um, the international nonprofit organizations um, there in China? I do know that within recent years, especially since the uh, 2008 Sichuan earthquake, um, there's been a high volume of money to flow into the country, um, but I also know that of many nonprofits there uh, are actually unregistered, and so therefore they don't have the opportunity to uh, have a corporate bank account or the uh, means to actually um, to solicit money with inside the country. Um, so I do want to know, um, do you get a sense that uh, China is really moving in the direction of, of inviting uh, many of those nonprofit organizations to actually become registered so that they don't, uh, in the end, abandon their mission? Those are three very big questions. Can you guys handle uh, that quickly? Well, I'll try to, let me start with education. Um, you know, this is one of the places, China's strong on education. Um, you know, this is part of Chinese culture. Uh, and maybe I, I don't usually go into cultural stereotypes at all, but uh, Confucian culture, whether it's Korea, Vietnam, uh, China, Taiwan, all these places, literacy rates were always higher than their GDP would suggest that they should be by world standards. Um, you know, in the Cultural Revolution, I, I've never asked Yahweh what he did, but I know so many people that took their books to the countryside and assumed that someday the Cultural Revolution would end and they studied. Uh, it, it's, it's really hardwired. Uh, now, the Chinese educational system has some problems uh, in terms of overstressing memorization and maybe uh, some lacunae in teaching history and a few other areas. But I think that education is one of the really great strengths of China in, in developing as a country. Uh, Security Council, uh, China, is, as, as John said a moment ago, has been a, a pretty status quo country and uh, has gone along. It, it does not like to be isolated in the Security Council or internationally. So if we can get in the Perm 5, 4 to go along with something, China will usually go along. Uh, the problem has been on some issues where we can't get Russia to go along and China will uh, side with Russia, most recently, of course, in the case of Syria. Uh, and I think that China is just wrong on that. Uh, they vote not against the United States so much as the Arab League. And I, I think this is, again, an example of a diplomacy that I, I don't know what drives China. I can only say that they don't want to see one more country go democratic and put pressure on them. And so they probably lean that way. But I think this is not in their own long-term best interest. And I hope that in three weeks they'll change that. On the NGOs? <laughs> and on in, in, uh, NGOs. Uh, so NGOs are a challenge in China, much like the issues of independence of the judiciary. And that is... <coughs> Uh, the government is wary of both Chinese and foreign NGOs. Uh, and so the rules, took me a long time to figure this out, but uh, the rules are uh, opaque and hard to figure out uh, because they're meant to be opaque and hard to figure out. So, so it means that for domestic Chinese NGOs, it's, it's very hard to uh, be legal and above board and register, to have economies of scale, to collaborate nationally. And so forth, and I think it's a profound tragedy for China. Here's a, a increasingly prosperous China, all this citizen energy, and through better uh, and more open engagement of NGOs, you could actually channel it to address many social problems that governments in any country really can't do alone. But, but uh, it's left really to local officials to determine whether they'll allow particular Chinese NGOs to sort of be above board and flourish or not. And so that promotes corruption and disorganization. As for foreign NGOs, there's been a lot of debate in the Central Party School and elsewhere about are they good, are they not good, are they pernicious, are they intending to undermine the Chinese Communist Party or, or not? And I, at least in my experience with Chinese officials, see people who run the gamut, some people who say, you know, it's, it's absolutely great and, you know, having X or Y entity here in China has been very fruitful for us, and others who really are very suspicious about what the motivations are of American or Western European NGOs. 
Thank you. I'm sorry we can't take more questions. There is a consolation prize, however. President Carter responded to a question about Chinese political reform on our blog, that's at cartercenter.org, earlier today. And you can visit that site, watch the video of President Carter's explanation, and contribute to the discourse on our, our blog. Uh, I am so grateful to you all for coming and asking such provocative and stimulating questions. I also want to thank our, our panelists because it's been very good of them to take the time. I should have acknowledged at the start that this whole procedure could not have been put together without the help of Dr. Yahweh Liu's enormously talented colleagues who are sitting in the front row here, Marjorie Perry and Sean Deng. You might want to stand up for a second just to... Um, the, the, the next uh, a program that we're going to have in conversations is December 4th. It's our health colleagues' chance to give you some insight into trachoma. It's called In a Blink, How Blinding Trachoma Stands at the Edge of Elimination in Africa. And it, it is going to be extremely uh, interesting and timely given that this disease has afflicted millions. And we really have made enormous progress out there. So check cartercenter.org website to make your booking for that on December 4th. Uh, for those of you who are involved in social networking, you can follow us on Twitter, on our Facebook page, and YouTube. we got plenty of stuff going on. But I'm so glad you were able to come tonight. I hope you will join me in thanking Professors Alford and Pew Smith for their taking their time. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and we stand adjourned. Thank you.